Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Neil O'Dowd, and I'm the uncle of Rory Staunton, the brother of Orla Staunton and brother-in-law of Kieran Staunton. And April the 1st, 2012, was the worst day of my life. Um, that morning, I was awoken by a phone call saying that my nephew was extremely ill and was not going to recover. And it hit me like a lightning bolt. And it hit me like a lightning bolt that uh, my beloved nephew, who a week earlier, I had engaged in a very long political discussion about the 2012 political scene and fracking, in which he ran rings around me, um, was going to be snatched away just one week later from a disease that, frankly, I had never heard of. And I will only say today that I want to keep the focus on Rory and on all these other beautiful children here. I know you're all medical doctors and you're great men and women in your own right, but please, this is about the victims of sepsis. This is about the human lives. This is about the Fitzgerald family and the other families who are here, what they went through, and our dreams and hopes that Kieran and Orla have so articulately expressed that no other family will ever go through what they have gone through. I think they've been incredible. I think they've been remarkable. I think sepsis picked a very bad enemy when they picked on Orla and Kieran Staunton. And I think they have shown by what they've done so far, by what they're doing today, that this is a disease that's not cancer, that's not Ebola, that is curable, and that in this room today we have the people who can help cure that disease through awareness, through medical technology, and through your, your, your genius, which is very, very obvious. Um, I'd like to say to all of you that Kieran and Orla have always believed that Rory died for a reason, that other kids would be saved. He was that kind of a kid. And I'm sure Tommy Fitzgerald died for a reason, and Aaron Flatley died for a reason, and all the other kids here died who have died from sepsis. And that reason is that no other kid should die from it. And I feel very strongly that this room today, this event, is a huge step forward. And would you join me now in welcoming Rory, Rory's parents, Kieran and Orla Staunton. Okay. Um, as Rory's mom, I never wanted to be standing here. Um, I just want my little boy to be on his way to school, giving out about homework and giving out about me after him to do his homework and uh, uh, picking up his clothes. But unfortunately, we stand here today, and uh, as I said last night, it's been a very tough, tough, tough uh, road to walk. Uh, but we've met some really special people. Many of them are here in the room, which we, who we will, we will speak to and uh, will speak to us later. But most importantly, I, I want to recognize the children that are here to my right and their parents who are in the room with us um, and, and a little brother, or big brother. Um, so the, the first easel that you see over there is Tommy and Tommy's dad, Ken, and his brother, Kenny, are here today. Um, and then, um, that's Tommy. Uh, Tommy died a year ago uh, from sepsis uh, in very similar circumstances to Rory. Um, and then there's George, George Shearer from Florida, who, um, who died after a road accident and from sepsis. And George's parents, Debbie and her husband, are here this morning. Um, Tyler from Florida. And then we have Aaron Flatley, and we're all here. Uh, Really, we're on your shoulders, Carl. Um, you, have been, you have been our hero in this battle um, against sepsis. And we all know the love that you had and have in your heart for Aaron and how you started us on this road. And after Rory died, you were one of the first phone calls I got. And it was so beautiful to, to meet a man of your nobility in this process. So to you, Carl, we really do honor you here today. So
So the next child over is Rory, and I will have Kiran speak. There's not enough time, not in this day or in this generation, to talk about what Rory drained off, what he did and what he would do, from what as a young boy, when, when Rosa Parks died, he was six years old, and he asked the teacher to discuss Rosa Parks because, as an individual, she had such a profound effect he had read and I had met her. The teacher said it wasn't on the schedule that day, so I'm wondering who should have been teaching that class. And to going on to creating a campaign, say no to the R word, where he got everyone in the school to stop saying that they would not use, no longer use the word retard. And there were many other issues. After he died, we found a letter he had written to the North Korean leader. He had written and he had found to send it through the UN. He had found the address. And he had a fairly basic question. He said, I'm a 12-year-old in school. I have a question. I hope you answer me. Why is it that you have so much money to build up such a huge military presence, and yet your people are dying of starvation? That was his question. Now. What have we left? There it is. And what even worse again is we now know what the world knows is that Rory Staunton need not have died on the night. And then we know that since Carl Flatley came to Capitol Hill 12 years ago, that 3 million Americans have died from sepsis, unnecessarily most of them. Because we now know that sepsis is not just something that no one can find a cure to, sepsis is savable. People don't need to die from sepsis. We have other families here who we'll introduce later who has lost loved ones to sepsis or someone has barely lived after it, but missing many limbs and other functions. That doesn't need to happen. And government needs to do more. What we have done since we set up this in the last 12 months, and it's unfortunate that we had to be the first because we weren't the first to suffer. We got Rory's regulations in New York. We will have the author of it speaking later on. New York is the first government in the world, in the world, to have regulations mandated for sepsis. The, at the time, New York medical experts said it would save between six and thousand, six and eight thousand New Yorkers a year. If we can do it in New York, surely we can do it nationally. We had a hearing in the United States Senate last year, very first hearing in the United States government on sepsis. We have been on the Today Show. We've went on Dr. Oz. It is not easy to go on national show and have your son's vital statistics from his death certs and everything shown. But to stop others going through the torture we're going through with the Fitzgeralds and everyone else, we have done that. It's been in the New York Times. Sully Sullenberg has, has came on board with us, our hero from the Hudson. But we've done an awful lot more work. We've been on the hill. We've been here for the last couple of weeks. You will hear more fruits of our labor has been announced here today from the next speaker and from other speakers. I don't want to go quoting John Paul Jones too often, but we have not just begun to fight. Because not alone have government an obligation, but we'll remind them they have an obligation. And the power is here on Capitol Hill, and your announcements here today will be telling you what we have lined up what government are expected, and the people who are coming here today as speakers on behalf of agencies, we will be asking them not alone what have they done in the last 12 months, because we'll be back here again this time next year, and we'll be marking their cards what they haven't done. And many more Americans have died unnecessarily, and unnecessarily is the word people need to keep in mind. So you'll hear a lot of announcements, a lot of things to do, but to your families here today with us, we're all in this together. And to the families watching out here whose names we don't know, we're with you too. And we all need to make sure that this has got to stop. New York's can cut it. North Shore LIJ will speak that they have cut fatalities from sepsis by 50% in five years. If they can do it in North Shore LIJ, why can't it be done nationally? Thank you very much. Thank you, Kieran. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the Irish Ambassador, Anne Anderson, and thank you very much for coming along. <laughs> and I'd like to welcome our next speaker, who is the greatest friend of Ireland in the US Congress, but not just of Ireland, but also of families with sepsis. 
people who are battling this disease. A congressman from Queens who is so proud of his heritage, but when you walk, as I walked with Joe through his congressional district a few years ago, and he showed me the 78 different nationalities and the 100 and so languages that they spoke, and Joe claimed to speak all of them himself. <laughs> but uh, he's been an incredible friend of our family since, uh, well, before the death of Ori, but certainly since the death of Ori, as a father, as a politician, as an elected official, but as a man who cares deeply about the children of this country. Would you welcome, please, Congressman Joe Crowley. <clears throat> Barely speak English, so just uh, <laughs> ready for the, I can speak. I can speak Queens very well. Yes, Queens is yes. Ambassador, good to see you again. Thank you for being here this morning and showing your support for such an important issue. Um, we here in Congress, we, we deal with life and death issues every day. And we look at what's happening around the world today. We ask ourselves, why are these things taking place? Um, and we can have an impact in some way or another, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Uh, but when there is something that we can do right here at home uh, to help stem the, uh, the tide of a disease or an infection <clears throat> that is preventable <clears throat> with proper care, proper attention, uh, that that's something uh, that needs to be addressed as much as any other issue. Uh, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, as a friend uh, of the Staunton family, as a friend of Rory's, uh, he was a constituent, but he was a young man that I got to know as well. Um, what I share with uh, Kieran, Orla, and Kathleen is that uh, I have a son who's Rory's age, and in many of the same ways, very uh, inquisitive about uh, life as Rory uh, was. And um, you could not help but be impacted when having met Rory. He was just an infectious young man in his own right, uh, someone that uh, became a part of you. Um, and um, I know that Orla and uh, uh, Kieran and his uncle uh, really can't do justice to his short life. Uh, but in many respects, what we do here today uh, does justice to that short life. Um, to the other families, to, the fam to George's family, to Tommy's family, to Aaron's family as well. Uh, your experience, your life experience, their life experience, and what it meant to you all is a treasure uh, to you personally that you now uh, not willingly but must share with the rest of us as well to make uh, those lives, and you continue to make those lives as important as they are to you, to all of us as well. Uh, we here in Congress, uh, we don't live in ivory towers. We don't, uh, for the most part, I should say. Not uh, a few of them do, but uh, many, most of us don't. Uh, we, we, we live amongst our constituents as well, and it's important for us to hear those stories, whether it be in Florida or New York or elsewhere, uh, to communicate and let members of Congress know we deal with a lot of issues, but that this issue is an issue that we must address because it's an issue that we can have a direct impact on. Sepsis can be treated but it requires a full-scale coordinated attack. New York State, I'm proud to say once again, is, is really leading the charge here, and in no small part because of the work of the Staunton family. Uh, former Commissioner Sharp uh, at Northern, North Shore LIJ have been critical partners in uh, moving forward, as you've heard already from, from Kieran, reducing uh, exposure to sepsis by 50 percent within their hospital system. But this is, the, this is an issue that the entire country needs to learn uh, and, uh, to, and, and really grow from the experience in New York and elsewhere. We don't have all the answers, but I think we, we really have, in many respects, been leading the charge here nationally. What it really needs, though, is a strong federal effort. This is not just an issue for New York and not just an issue for Florida or for Virginia or for elsewhere. It's, it is a national issue, and it needs a coordinated effort. Uh, Dr. Ferdinand of the CDC, I'm, I'm told, will be here later today and um, will become aware of what I'm about to uh, talk to you about. But the CDC and other agencies are an integral part of this fight to end sepsis here in the United States and elsewhere. 
I want to thank uh, Nicole Cohen for my staff who's with me here today. Uh, has been working very closely with, uh, with the Staunton family and the foundation. Um, we have a bill. And how often have you heard that? But we have a bill uh, that we think, uh, when enacted, will go a long way to bringing about that coordination. It's called the Rory Staunton Coordination, Awareness, Research, and Education for Sepsis Act. Coordination, Awareness, Research, Education, C-A-R-E, the CARE, the Rory Staunton CARE for Sepsis Act. The bill will require a national action plan on sepsis and the appointment of a single high-ranking sepsis designee at the Department of Health and Human Services. It will direct resources towards greater public awareness of the efforts that are being taken up, as well as research and improved education for medical professionals on uh, a, a need for early intervention when uh, an individual is brought to a facility and understanding what all the possibilities could be and leave nothing for chance. Congress itself needs to be more involved, and the launching of a Congressional Sepsis Caucus to be a platform for sharing ideas and evaluating the issues that we need to be aware of. Uh, as I said earlier, this is a personal issue for me because of my a relationship with Rory, but it has to be more than a personal issue for me. This has to be a national issue for all of us. Uh, and I want to do, and I will do my part in the House of Representatives, albeit in the minority, with my friends in the majority, to let them know uh, this is not a Democrat nor a Republican issue. Uh, this, uh, the, 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 the sepsis knows no political boundaries. This is a fight that we all need to be a part of so that individuals don't die senselessly uh, because of a cut or because of lack of proper care in a health facility uh, that uh, we all need to be aware and protected from that. I want to thank all the families that are here today. I want to thank all the medical professionals who are here today um, because uh, in, many, in, in all respects you're at the front line and it's, a, it's an incredible responsibility that you all have. Uh, I admire uh, the medical profession tremendously and uh, it's one of the highest if not the highest uh, uh, positions a person can have in our country. Uh, we think of what's happening around the world with Ebola uh, and uh, all the men and women who are on the front line of preventing the spread of that disease and other diseases as well. And here we have something that if proper care is done, if proper uh, attention is given, we can eliminate or certainly curtail uh, the number of deaths due to sepsis in the United States. It's a responsibility not only for you but for all of us to be a part of, and you're not alone in that fight. I want to be here to help you uh, get the resources that you need uh, to end this. I want to thank once again the Rory Staunton Foundation, North Shore LIJ, for this first sepsis forum, and I look forward to the last sepsis forum when we've stopped sepsis once and for all. I just lastly say, We'd all like to bring back our loved ones. We wish they were here, but they are here. They're here today. Uh, their presence is felt because you're all here. And the families are here to keep on their name uh, and what they were and who they were and who they are. Uh, and for that, we all will be eternally grateful. Uh, when the last person uh, contracts sepsis and is cured uh, because it was found early, it's because of no small part of the efforts that you all are a part of today. So once again, thank you all very, very much, especially to all the families that are here. God bless you all. Um, someone that reminds us all the time that um, sepsis is not just uh, an American or a local issue, is uh, Conrad Reinhardt. And um, Conrad is regularly on the phone to us with these reminders and is constantly traveling the world to different countries, uh, letting them know the statistics and letting them know what's going to happen if we don't look out for sepsis. 
So he is our next speaker today. He's the Director of Clinical Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine at the University Hospital of Frederick Schiller, University of Jena. And more importantly for me, he is the Chairperson of Global Sepsis Alliance. So this is uh, Conrad Reinhardt. Thanks, uh, Olet. Uh, this is indeed a great day, an important day in the fight against sepsis. What I have heard by the congressman that you will go for a national action plan against sepsis is what is badly needed, not only in the US, but in every country of the world. And I am here <coughs> for that reason, and I want to say from the very beginning that what Rory Staunton's death and what the reaction of the family on this unnecessary death was is so helpful not to prevent only deaths in the US but all over the world because what applies here applies everywhere. Can you please move forward? This, okay. okay. So this was at the turn of two centuries back where William Osler, who was one of the most known physicians at his time, declared that mankind has three enemies, which is war, famine, and fever. And he said that by far fever was the largest one. However, and this was a time where the whole society was focusing to fight the war against infection and the consequences. And this is a statement 70 years later by the Surgeon General of the US who said in 1972 that the book of infectious diseases can be ultimately closed. And this quote has cost millions of lives because this induced a paradigm shift away from research, away from care, education, etc., etc. And he made this quote due to the successes that we had made from 19 to 1960, where in 1900, 800 out of 1,000 Americans died from infections. And if you die from infection, you die from sepsis. So that's, that's the point. And this was only interrupted in 1920. There was a continuous decrease when the so-called influenza pandemic, Hispanic flu, went on. And how was it achieved? By public measures, by setting up healthcare departments in the, in the uh, counties and in the cities by chlorine, chloration, chlorine, chlorine in water, etc., by inventing antimicrobials, by doing research to have vaccines, etc., etc. But I will tell you, all these patients here who died from the Spanish flu, they died from sepsis, and many of them would have survived when at this time intensive care were available, which is now available. We still have no antimicrobial to fight the influenza virus because there is no research in this field. And so we need to be prepared also in the future. So what the Surgeon General had forgotten, he had first of all only a perspective from the developed world. Still, and this is data from 2004, from the Global Burden of Disease Report, we have 13.7 deaths from infection. And the majority of these deaths from infection is due to sepsis, compared to 7 million deaths from cancer per year globally. It's only cardiovascular diseases with 17 million, which has more deaths worldwide. And as I said, it's poorly understood still now 
that the majority of the deaths from infections are due to sepsis. And we need to talk about this. And also, what's going on on Ebola is the same thing. These people, if they die, die because their immune system cannot cope with the replication of this virus. There is no treatment against this virus so far, and that's why they die from multiple organ failure and, and septic shock. And this is a quote from an excellent paper from Lancet, from Feldman and Geisbert, and they say, in some way, resembling septic shock. It's not resembling septic shock, it's septic shock. And hemorrhagic fever is a misnomer because these people don't die from bleeding. Only 50% have some impairment of coagulation, but we see this every day with every sepsis patients too. And I, I have to congratulate um, Tom Frieden and your President Obama that he is sending now 3,000 US soldiers to West Africa to, to get these things under control. And we have commonly to learn these lessons um, in, in a common way. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there is no good data on the incidence of sepsis worldwide. We did a systematic research. We were just about to submit. And if you look at this map, most of these countries, there, there, there's white. There's not a single study and a single statistic in most of the countries on the prevalence or on the incidence of sepsis. So what, what we found, and, and there's a, a number of studies, we figured out the first studies at all was only in 1970, so that, that sepsis was counted in, a, in, in, in some way by, by some bureaus of statistics. We came up with 18.7 million cases if we take it together. If we look only on the studies from 2003 to 2013, we estimate 20, 32 million sepsis cases per year on a global level, and 30%, at least 30% of these uh, people uh, die. And this is mostly extrapolated from studies like in the US, where you have at least, along the ICD codes, for administrative purposes, some data. And due to the great work from Kaisers, um, uh, we, we, we know that these numbers that we have so far in the US may also be underestimated by a factor of two to three. So the burden, the real burden, is much greater than what we have thought. And, if you, and we all know that in the so-called resource-poor areas of the world, the burden of infection is much greater than in the developed world. So when we talk about 30 million, this is also very likely an underestimation. It's not known that, for example, dengue fever, which is another, which may lead to dengue shock, dengue shock is nothing other than, than septic shock, has increased by the factor of 30 over the last three years. And the, and the real estimation, and this is a paper in Nature, is three times as high uh, as the WH thought before. And there are 300 million infections and, 90, and, and close to 100 million with severe uh, dengue fever. So uh, this burden is recognized. But the burden of sepsis does not only increase in these countries, it increases also in the US, in, in our emergency departments. This is data from Kings County, published recently in a, in a very prestigious uh, journal, where you see that from 100 encounters at the emergency department in 2000, there was a similar number between stroke, heart attack, and uh, a sepsis. And here, this red column indicates that the number of encounters more than tripled over the last 10 years in King County in the US. And I'm sure that if you had statistics in North Shore, you would see the same thing. Part of it is not only an increase, but it's, it's recognized better and documented better in the meanwhile. But there's also objectively an increase because uh, for, uh, for various reasons. And I was very sad in, and in some way 
angry about these perspective people in the New England Journal attacking the mandates that have been made uh, by the governor of New York, Cuomo, where they say reasons for caution. So because what they said, they talk about an apparent explosion in sepsis and, that this, and, and they deplore that this was sparing high-profile initiatives. And they mean you and they mean others. And they, they, they criticize it. What they, what they don't see or don't want to see for whatever reasons, that not only in the US, and this is data in, from Australia published in JAMA only several months ago, where the number of admissions of patients with severe sepsis to the ICU decreased from 7% of all admissions to 11%. And what they also could show in Australia, and they are very good intensivists over there in Australia, that the mortality over the last 10 years there decreased from 35% to 15%. So this is not what you show in your hospitals and what other ha has shown is not yeah, it's not fake, it's, it's, it's real, and they have controlled for uh, confounders and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, and if we don't trust in this data and don't act along this data, we do a mistake, and it's deplorably that a journal like the New England Journal uh, makes such uh, statements. Likewise, what we have seen also published in the New England Journal that the great study which was done in Detroit by Manny Rivers, who t which told us that again, patients in the emergency department who had a mortality rate of 45% in, in 2001, when they were cared especially with some special aggressive early fluid resuscitation and some monitoring, they could reduce mortality at this time from 46% to 30%. Now, and this is a study, multi-center study in the US with a best centers in the country. They had three groups. In all these groups, mortality was 18.1%, 18.9%, or 21%. So, and what they learned was, it's all about early recognition. You don't need fancy monitoring devices. You just must be educated and train your staff, have algorithms, and, and, back and so forth. So, and what they said, and this is from, from, from the publications. First, early recognition, not over transfuse patients because also blood transfusion may, may be harm. Implementation of lung protective strategies. It's all about optimizing intensive care medicine, control of blood sugar, and overall improvement of quality of care. And this again is a quality improvement uh, issue. So it is doable what is doable in the best hospitals of the country must also be doable in others. And we started to learn in terms of increasing awareness from other disciplines like cancer. They, in 1948, learned and want where, where, where there was no cure for cancer. They asked, ironically, for a penicillin against cancer, and they did big campaigns, they understood that they need to make campaigns. They had ads in the New York Times asking and saying, Mr. Nixon, you can cure cancer. They asked for a Manhattan Project against cancer. They had changes in the law. They revised how cancer research was organized at the NIH, etc., etc. So we also have learned it took us time, and we are 30 years back uh, compared with them, and there's a, a number of national initiatives developed over time, and uh, we have here Carl Flatley and the Stonson, and as I said, they have done such a great job. We only started in early 2000 on the international level, but we have now not only the World Federation of Pediatric Intensive Care has started in 2007 an initiative. And they were also, together with the Sepsis Alliance here, co-founders of the Global Sepsis Alliance. And now we have the third uh, World uh, Sepsis Day. 
And let me come back for a minute to the detrimental consequences of this statement of the Surgeon General. It's still, we have poor at, um, awareness for sepsis. We have a decrease in effective antibiotics, a steadily decrease because there's no research. We have too little research in effective antivirals. We have poor public funding, uh, as we can see, for, for sepsis. <laughs> in fact, it's... Uh, uh, and, and, and also infectious disease, at least in my country, in many countries, is very poorly developed compared to cancer, cardiology, uh, what, whatever discipline. Because of this paradigm shift, the brightest people have been infectious diseases 100 years ago, but they are no longer because research money and career perspectives um, are, 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 are elsewhere. And there was no lobby. Uh, for sepsis, but we have a lobby now with the Stauntons. We have, since 2005, a German sepsis aid where 170 people, seven days, 24 hours, organized counseling all over the country. So this takes time to build up, but we are there. We, we, we can to learn, and we have poor knowledge on prevention, poor knowledge on the possibility of prevention. People don't know that you need, you can get vaccinated and you should get vaccinated if you are above 60 against pneumococci and also for influenza. There's data from Scandinavia that by this, in the elderly, you can reduce, reduce mortality by 50%. We have, we spend a lot of money for education uh, uh, to prevent HIV, which is good and which is great, but this, the regular people, the normal people, uh, the elderly people have the same right to get educated how they can prevent severe infections than other ones. And we have a fatigue, fatigue uh, uh, vaccination fatigue. And this is, this is our slide similar to that. You, here you see the incidence of, of sepsis compared to stroke, cancer, heart disease, and HIV, and down here, you see the research dollars uh, that are spent for these various uh, diseases. And another problem is that in the Global Burden of Disease Report, which is published annually by the World Bank and the WHO, you see leading is cardiovascular diseases. At second, at second place is lower respiratory tract infections. But the word sepsis does not show up there. It shows up because on the other side, you die only from lower respiratory tract infection if you develop sepsis. Sepsis is only there on rank 20 or some sort uh, as disorder, sepsis and other infectious disorders of the newborn baby. So we, what does not show up in the global burden of disease report does not reach policymakers, does not reach the public, does not least the lay press, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we need to work on this, that people, that we speak about sepsis. When somebody dies, he dies. Pneumonia is a cause, but he or she dies from sepsis. So that is our problem. And also in the annual report from the Minister uh, of Health, how we call it in Europe, of Germany, if you look and do a, a search, the word sepsis did not appear in 2007. It's good that in the new treaty of the new government in Germany, we have now sepsis and antibiotic resistance as a task for, for the government. And that's why it's not in the media, it's not in the reports, and also lay people, you know, and this is from 2002, more than 10, more than 90% don't know what sepsis is. This is an actual BOLS from 2014, where you still see that in Brazil only 7% know it, in the, have heard the word uh, sepsis, in Canada it's 29%, in US, and this is due to your work, it's 44%, it was less than 20% in 2002, in Germany uh, at least 49% uh, have heard the word sepsis so far. So that, that shows us that, that we can make a difference. If you look, and this is again German media, main media, 
and say how often the word sepsis is cited compared to AIDS and myocardial <laughs> infarction and cancer, it's by a factor of one to 300 more times that you will find these words. And when CNN reported on the death of Reeves, they said he died from cardiac arrest on a Saturday. And he died, as you know, from a pressure wound. And he must have had this sepsis at least 10 days, and nobody recognized it. And it was only recognized when he went into cardiac arrest and brought to the hospital and died a day later. But uh, CNN, they talk on a systemic infection, at least in a, but the word sepsis does not uh, uh, appear. And this is true from, and we have to say and, and know that a, lo a lot of very high profile VIP people um, have also died of sepsis, but what, and many of them also could live. But what we need to do, we have to make sepsis a VIT, a very important disease. And, and, and this, is, this is one of our tasks. And, and as I said, the cancer people were very good at it. They asked for a moonshot for cancer. And also we can learn so much about the successful fight against AIDS. And this is really a success story both in terms of prevention, but also in terms of developing effective antivirals. This virus was not known in 1980, but now we have effective endovirals. Nobody no longer must die because of the research efforts, both by industry, but also by fun public funding. So it's doable. We can also fight viruses. And also that the fact that we have at least some drugs preclinically for Ebola was the fact that Bush, under the label of BioShield, spent five billion for the development of some vaccines uh, against Ebola and, and drugs because of the fear uh, of, of, of these kind of attacks. So it's, it's doable. And this, this is in German. This says every day in Germany seven people get infected from HIV. What is, what, what is not known that every day in Germany 150 people die from sepsis. And as I said before, this is governmental money. If we would spend half the money that is spent on preventing uh, sexual transmissible diseases, for education on prevention of daily diseases, we can, could really make a, a, a difference. And also we in Germany ask, and, 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 and um, Tyrion was on the summit, the, the government to have a national action plan. And we met last week with uh, the, a minister of, 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 the, um, uh, of the German uh, government uh, here who is an intensivist, and we repeated our request for such national action plan. And he announced here that on the next G7 uh, summit, which will be in Germany, that they will put uh, infection and sepsis on the agenda. So we slowly make some progress, uh, which is badly needed. So what is the way forward? We have to foster these quality initiatives. We have to work with the governments, which uh, yeah, we, we, we can see here in a perfect way. We have to care that sepsis is coded along the ICD coding because if, if it's not coded, it does not show in the, in the, national, in the international global of bit burden of disease reports. And to the end, another quote of William o Osler. He had already realized in 1904 and said, except on few occasions, the patient seems to die from the body's response to infection rather than from it. This has severe implications. This means we need not only to fight the germ, the bacteria, the bug. This requires a special treatment of these consequences, which is shock, which is treatment of organ dysfunction. And that's why if we don't talk about sepsis, nobody understands that we have two main components in the fight against sepsis, the fight against the infection and the fight against the consequences of these infections. And this is what we have to do. And uh, as I said, we need to get it in the global 
burden of disease report, we have to foster our collaboration with WHO. We have started this. We need to bring sepsis on the agenda of the United Nations because this is a way to get mandated for World Sepsis Day and then uh, we get acknowledgement and we, we, we need to strengthen the national and the international co cooperation. And great, again, great due to, due to the great work of Ole and, and Kirian, uh, also with the CDC, uh, uh, Dom Frieden has become an ambassador for World Sepsis Day, which is so important, not only for your country, but also in my country, because I can say, look, the most prestigious Center for Disease Control in the world has recognized how important sepsis is, and this helps to put up pressure there. And as I said, I will skip this. We are in contact with the, with the WHO. And what they said, we look forward to, and this is from an email, to further collaboration with GSA. This is especially timely now due its relevance to Ebola. Though so they have understood uh, how important uh, this is, this have been our activities on all five continents in more than uh, in more than 40 countries with more than 200 events, and I am sure that we will have more events this year. And I think this is the way uh, to go. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Conrad. Thank you very much. You got here late last night. There's some figures you mentioned, and I think if you look over to my right and your left, you can see quite clearly how funding has been spent. Sepsis at the moment is $190 per death. AIDS, $308,000. Right? 15,000 for others go down along. And when you see on here the number of people a, uh, sepsis is killing in comparison to others, it is absolutely astonishing. $190. That's it. That's what's come to. Uh, Conrad also mentioned the word sepsis. Yes, we try to get everyone to say the word sepsis. Some years ago, most organizations here, health organizations, didn't even have the word sepsis on there. Some of them still haven't, actually, still even today. So well done, and thank you very much, Orla. Our next speaker is, uh, is very special to us. Um, as a parent, uh, I certainly thought I was doing everything right. Uh, my kids were very happy. They were in what I thought was a good school, safe school. Um, we had a very well-known pediatrician, and we lived in New York City where I thought the best hospitals were. Um, well, unfortunately, every single one of those institutions let us down, our school, our pediatrician, our hospital, and on the 1st of April 2012, our son Roy died. Um, after the, well, we're still in shock, but after the initial shock, we began looking to see what Roy actually, what happened? How did he die so fast? How was he, you know, such a healthy kid, 169 pounds, five foot nine, on Wednesday, and dead on Sunday night? And we discovered sepsis. Um, and. What, what we found was a lot of people were said to us, oh yeah, it's sepsis, it's sepsis, you know, and, and, and the impression was there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, and, then, and then we met Dr. Shah, uh, who was the New York State Health Commissioner, and he was a breath of fresh air, because Dr. Shah decided that he was going to grab sepsis in New York State by the throat, and he was going to do something about it. And he did, and we got Rory's regulations in New York State, which this year is expected to save between 5,000 and 8,000 lives. So Dr. Shah is no longer, unfortunately, our loss is uh, California's gain. So he's currently serving as the Senior Vice President, Chief Operating Officer for Clinical Operations at Kaiser Permanente. Um, but to us, he's our hero, and he's the author of Rory's regulations. So Thank you. It's my privilege to honor the memory of Rory, Tommy, George, Aaron, and thousands of other children. You know, a few years ago in New York, whether you lived or died 
from sepsis was kind of like winning the lottery. The rates from one hospital to the next of survival ranged from 15 percent to 45 percent with no clear understanding of why. Doctors approach the care of sepsis as a complex systems problem. What does that mean? Oh, it's complicated. The emergency room points to the lab. The lab points to the ICU. The ICU points to the wards. The wards point back to the emergency room. It's their problem. It's their problem. It's not my problem. I can't figure it out. There was no accountability in our systems. How do we get there? Well, in America, our very culture is predicated on independence. That lone cowboy on a frontier best represents the classic American doctor. We are taught in medical school to rely on ourselves, to resort to heroics, perhaps after it's too late, to try to save our patients. And yet, sadly, that analogy doesn't work in medicine anymore. The cowboys of medicine are a dying breed. But there's no good analogy or story to replace that first one. Today, more of how we practice medicine is about accountability, not just autonomy. Team-based care, where the old hierarchies don't exist, where a nurse or even a patient can pull the cord that stops the assembly line, have overturned those sacred tenets of medicine. So is it really a debate about autonomy versus accountability? About capitalism versus socialism? About the moral dilemma the doctors face? About the unfettered free market in a retail environment? versus the unfeeling cold al algorithms imposed on us b by HMOs, by regulators, and big government? In fact, the facts say differently. The best medicine today is practiced by those doctors who go the extra mile for their patients, who use their instincts to check that extra blood test. But the best medicine is also practiced by integrated delivery systems, by forward-leaning, thoughtful leaders at places like North Shore LIJ, Kaiser Permanente, and others, who have achieved unheard of quality scores, who have process improvement experts stationed at every corner, and can tell you to the minute when a patient's lactate results will be back. And that's the paradox and the promise of American medicine. What I've learned from Rory's regs is that autonomy and accountability are not mutually exclusive. It's an and, not an or. Autonomy and accountability. And when you achieve that fine balance between the two, only then can our patient-centered paradigm be achieved. We're getting to realize that that culture of interdependence, where we rely on each other, can result in reliable excellence, where every patient with sepsis wins the lottery and has early recognition of their condition, gets aggressive fluid resuscitation, and gets early antibiotics. In New York State, thanks to Rory's regulations, we have in the first quarter of this year already documented 10,000 cases of sepsis and severe sepsis. Imagine that what that will do to research and the field and the care of these patients. With R Rory's regulations, it's also shown us that it is possible to make regulations that are general enough to work in a changing environment where science evolves, where the evidence changes, and yet specific enough to actually make progress on this number one killer. The previously, ex uh, the previously unexplained, and I would argue unethical heterogeneity, variability, is being diminished as we speak. 
And our job as for, uh, caregivers has always been about first to do no harm, but I argue that it also includes to aggressively understand and apply the evidence. I believe that the moral dilemma that we used to face as doctors has been replaced by an ethical imperative when it comes to sepsis. And I challenge every single one in this room and everyone watching to take up that challenge. Rory, Tommy, George, Aaron, and others deserve no less. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, wonderful remarks. Um, I'd now like to uh, call on Patrick Conway, MD, MSc, Deputy Minister for Innovation and Quality Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and the Chief Medical Officer of Center for Medicare and Medicaid. Would you welcome, please, Dr. Patrick Conway? We're lost in. Uh Kieran, thanks for having me today, uh, and thanks for all your work uh, um, in memory of your son and on behalf of so many people. Um, uh, as, as a few of you know, um, late yesterday I was uh, tried to be pulled away to meet with a bunch of CEOs and actually resisted that um, because this, uh, this particular topic I think is so important. I'll share a couple stories of why. I'm not going to go through all the slides in detail. Um, uh, but um, really think uh, this work is critically important for our health system. Uh, in 2006, I actually uh, called my mother, I still don't know exactly why, um, uh, and said, you know, Mom, how's it going? Uh, my father, who had uh, cancer at the time, um, she said, you know, he feels really sick. He's just sitting there, not moving that much. Uh, got a little dizzy at work, so I went and went, picked him up has, you know, started asking her questions, has some redness on his leg, had spread slightly, um, asked my mother to take my father, I, we live thousands of miles away at the time, uh, to the hospital. He did have sepsis, E. coli sepsis, was treated in an ICU setting, got better, lived uh, for another number of years. Um, but I think a tangible example of the difficulty of, of early diagnosis had actually seen his physician uh, that's, that morning as well. Um, I still work in the hospital setting. I'm a pediatric hospital medicine physician. I'm working this weekend, so I'll start my shift at 5 o'clock on Friday. Um, uh, almost every weekend, I work on academic teams. I have a resident who presents to me and says, you know, this child was admitted for rule out sepsis. And then I routinely say back, sepsis is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, he's admitted for rule out serious bacterial infection, but if you're not looking for sepsis clinically, then we are all in trouble, and this child and family are not in the safest environment they can be. Um, so in a real, um, hopefully, tangible way, um, I think it's incredibly important, the work you're doing. I want to thank you for that. Um, I will go through some slides at a high level. I'm not going to do the details of these. I can, I can share the, the slides after with anybody who wants the detail. Um, at CMS, we're really trying to move to a system that is patient-centered, outcomes-driven, focused on what's best for patients and families, and, and around data transparency, quality reporting, value-based purchasing, really trying to incentivize the behavior we want out of the health system, and working with the public and private sector on that. Um, we have, um, we are working on a number of health care acquired conditions and actually are working on sepsis as, as well right now and I'll speak to that. This is our results from our Partnership for Patients initiative. This is uh, ARC national scorecard results where they do chart review on patient harm in this country. And the first time in history, harm in hospitals has gone down significantly in this country. So in the last two years, down almost 10 percent. That's over 520,000 injuries, infections avoided, avoided over 15,000 lives saved, and about $4 billion in cost savings. Um, and it's important to note, uh, and I'll come back to this, this initiative started before I sort of got involved, really focused on health care. Uh, acquired conditions, we're spreading it out to early diagnosis uh, and, to, and to sepsis as well. Um, other uh, parts of this, early elective delivery, a number of measures going in the right direction. We're focused on reducing harm uh, across this country. I will, a couple of speakers spoke to this. It's a cultural uh, phenomenon, so you want high reliability systems that detect um, 
events such as serious infections and then can treat those events. Um, when I was at Cincinnati Children's, which is the system I was in right before this one, it was all around situational awareness, using everything from monitoring to bedside huddles to um, other initiatives, uh, really to make sure we detect events before they occur and then can treat uh, those events. Um, these are a number of the initiatives uh, we're working on in the first phase. Um, so CMS is focused on, on sepsis. Um, we are attacking this from multiple directions. One, on public reporting, we did propose and finalize a uh, sepsis bundle measure for our, our hospital reporting programs. This means all hospitals across the U.S. will have to report on this measure uh, and report publicly. We then, from a statutory construct, we have to report publicly for a year before we move into value-based purchasing where it's pay for performance, but we're on that pathway. Um, Two, on conditions of participation in survey and certification, we oversee all the healthcare providers in the U.S. We're trying to put in new rules and regulations and oversee those rules and regulations with regard to sepsis and detection as well. And um, in the Innovation Center, and I'll talk more about this, we're now pilot testing in a number of hospitals across the country uh, initiatives on early detection and treatment of sepsis. Um, so we're focused here on rapid cycle improvement, innovation, and ultimately the goal of lives saved and costs reduced. Um, our goal overall is to eliminate harm in the health system. So we're working with hospital engagement networks across this country. We're actually engaged uh, with about 3,800 hospitals right now. So about 80% of the hospitals in the U.S. are engaged in this initiative uh, focused on uh, detecting and eliminating harm. Uh, I won't read all these quotes, but the, the top one, just an example from Ascension, committed to the health and well-being for our communities and the response to the needs of individuals throughout the life cycle. These organizations are taking up uh, the desire and the mission to eliminate harm in their health systems. Um, we funded uh, a little over a year ago now um, a focus on advanced topics in this network. Sepsis was one of those topics. Uh, as Gene and a few people will note in the, in the audience, uh, when we had the discussion, I asked the question why it wasn't in the first 10, and so we uh, added it quickly as number 11. Um, and all of our leaped hospitals are actually working on sepsis. So some areas not all hospitals are working on, but they're all working on sepsis. Um, so we're rolling this out now across a number of hospitals. We do let them set goals that, that, that makes, the goal is eventually to, uh, to uh, uh, eliminate mortality from sepsis, but obviously that's a, a, a difficult goal to attain in the near term. So they set interim goals on reduction of mortality in the uh, generally 10 to 40 percent range. These are the sites, there's 73 pilot sites across the country, and the goal here is to prove this is successful and then roll it out across the country. Uh, to the entire network, which would be 80% of health systems. Um, as, as was alluded to, and I think is under-recognized nationally, you know, major killer um, in this country, uh, sepsis. So if you attained those 10 uh, to 40% reductions, you'd be talking about 27,000 to over 100,000 people a year uh, being treated, going home, uh, uh, and be adequately treated. Um, here's some of their progress. The short version of this slide, you have a, some systems that have actually already attained their goal. So very early have attained their goal prior to December 2014. You have other systems that are, that are in progress on attaining the goal. You know, our key objectives are really just try to spread these best practices across health systems to measure the care for sepsis and to incentivize high quality care and really to help health systems and physicians and clinicians build the high reliability systems they need to adequately detect the disease and to treat it appropriately. I did want to share a couple uh, just um, high level results on the, on the overall effort. So sepsis is a, is a piece of these results, but is not the entirety. Um, this is the network uh, and, uh, of the Partnership for Patients Hospitals, as I said, about 80% of hospitals reporting the light gray line is improving on five or more areas of harm significantly. So that's a 30% reduction in five or more areas of harm. You have over two-thirds of hospitals achieving those results. The very bottom line, we defined what best-in-class performance was for reducing harm. So we looked at the top 2% of hospitals and we challenged all hospitals to reach that best-in-class performance. We now have a third of hospitals in the U.S. 
in this network achieving best-in-class performance on five or more areas of harm. So reducing harm uh, across uh, their system. Early on in this work, people said, I only want to work on one or two things, and we push back robustly. You need to have a system that focuses across areas of potential harm and drives improvement across your system. As I mentioned, this, tra this translates into you know, over a half a million injuries and infections avoided um, and about $4 billion in cost savings. So as we do this work and as we do the sepsis work, we're really focused on culture change. Um, uh, and so as we work with these hospitals, it's how can you change your systems, whether, and I love Nirav and Dr. Shaw's uh, comments were directly on target, you know, how do you change your system of care? And it's a whole community system from the primary care pediatricians to the hospital setting to community knowledge. So I really applaud you that you're taking a system view uh, as you improve uh, our nation's uh, focus on this uh, disease. Um, and the type of questions we ask is, you know, how can you detect sepsis earlier in your system? How can you effectively treat the disease? What are your monitoring systems in your system so that if the person at the bedside, you have, you know, backup things like electronic health records, monitoring, et cetera, you have backup systems to really try to identify the disease reliably uh, and treat uh, early. Um, this happens to be my three children, um, but this could be any of us. I talked about this with my wife this morning. It's very meaningful to me as a person. I, I really appreciate your work. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Conway. They were very, very personal remarks. Um, okay. Um, Dr. Kevin Tracy um, completely believed in us from the get-go and, uh, and um, made us feel that he was going to be by our side uh, in, in this fight against sepsis. Um, he's also, uh, besides being a, a very, very well-known doctor and writer, um, he's currently the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Feinstein Institute. Um, for me, uh, I read his book, which I would recommend to anyone, which is called Fatal Sequence, The Killer Within, and it's a heartbreaking, beautifully written story from a doctor's point of view about the death of a little girl from sepsis. And as I was reading it, I felt like I was the mother of a little girl, and as I was reading it, I realized how much care and love Dr. Tracy had for his patient. So uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tracy. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. It's, uh, it's really an honor to be here working towards this noble cause to accomplish an achievable objective. I'm a neurosurgeon who's been studying sepsis for 30 years. That's a somewhat unusual combination. Most neurosurgeons don't study sepsis. Uh, I study sepsis because of Janice. I met Janice when she was 11 months old after she'd had an accidental scald injury at home and she died in my arms. She had, we had cared for her for nearly a month and we're in the process of getting ready to send her home from the hospital after a very difficult month in the hospital. And I was walking by her room at lunchtime, uh, the day before she was to go home, and the nurse was giving her lunch, was giving Janice a baby bottle, and was rocking her in a rocking chair. And Janice rolled her eyes back and died. I ran into the room and gave her mouth to mouth. Janice, the only patient I've ever given mouth to mouth to. The cardiac arrest that followed was flawless. There was a cardiac surgeon, Dr. Al Fister, God rest his soul, who happened to be walking by the door with me. And we worked on her for an hour and she died. And I had to tell Janice's mother that her daughter was gone. And Janice's mother cried out and fainted, and I never saw her again. But I did also have long conversations with the family afterwards and tried to answer their questions. 
when they said to me, why? What happened? And all I could say in 1985 was, I don't know. There was no infection. There were no bacteria in her bloodstream. She seemed to be fine, and she was gone. And so from that day since, I have spent my career trying to understand the, mole the molecular basis and the immune system basis of why Janice died, called sepsis. She died of sepsis. And what we've learned since then has been tremendous. We now have, 30 years later, a very exquisite and precise molecular and genetic understanding of what happens when sepsis occurs. We understand that a minor injury and a minor infection can activate immunological immune system responses that damage organs, that damage the brain, that damage the heart, that damage the kidney, the liver, and the gut. And we understand that these exact same processes can occur even when there's no infection. These same processes can be activated after injuries that do not have viral or bacteria or fungal infections. So what can we do about it? It's possible to identify specific molecules and make antidotes to each and every one of these molecules. And this has been done time and time again for 30 years. Much of this knowledge of these molecules has cured patients with other diseases. One of the first molecules we were interested in and many other people were interested in is called TNF. TNF is now an approved drug target for rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease, and millions of patients receive these antibodies to either cure or help them in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease and, and rheumatoid arthritis. Millions, millions and millions of patients worldwide. These antibodies didn't work in, in sepsis. They worked in the laboratory, they didn't work in the clinic. Same thing for IL-1, same thing for IL-6, same thing for other molecules that target clotting cascades. These molecules all work in the laboratory. Many of them are useful in treating patients with other diseases, but we don't have a cure for sepsis. Thirty years later, we don't have a cure for sepsis. To paraphrase Thomas Edison, I'm not, I'm not pessimistic. Someone asked Thomas Edison, as he was trying to make a light bulb, how he was doing. You know, the, the friend or reporter, whoever it was, said, I heard you failed thousands of times at trying to make your light bulb. Edison said, I haven't failed once. I know thousands of things that don't work. <laughs> and he went on and made the light bulb. Now, 50 or so plus clinical trials that have failed in sepsis have not failed. We know 50 ways of doing it that doesn't work. The, the challenge for us today is to view research into this as the engine that drives the ability to make cures that we need today. When a plane's losing altitude, you don't cut the engine to save weight. And look at that chart. These are, these are tough financial times for, for research in the United States. Research funding is under assault in this country and in many countries of the world. Money's tight. But cutting research is like dropping, cutting research support is like dropping the engine off a plane because you're losing altitude. Now is not the time to do that. And in the context of understanding sepsis and the ability to cure it, my favorite definition of research is very simple. Research is the process of creating the future. We must do that. And I am thrilled to hear the Congressman's announcement of a proposed bill which will feature C-A-R-E, R for research, as a key objective of what we have to accomplish here today. Janice lives in my story. Your children and friends and parents and loved ones gone to sepsis live in your stories. And our obligation is to carry those stories forward because we can do this. We can make the light bulb. We can cure sepsis.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tracy. I also want to recognize uh, Dr. John D'Angelo from North Shore LIJ also is here, worked with us. Success of many fathers, failures in orphan, but John, D Dr. D'Angelo worked with us when we were with Dr. Darfler and everyone else when we were drawing up the Rory's regulations. Um, I also want to now recognize some people who are here who have lost people from sepsis, but not children. Uh, Chris Eddington, and, sorry, Vanessa Eddington is here. She lost her dad here from Iowa. And t as we now know, they came from Iowa with Chris. <laughs> and, and they did what we we're going to be doing a lot of in the future. Before they came here, they went to Congress to Capitol Hill yesterday to meet with their senators and their Congress members. And that's something we'll be talking about later. They have said their dad is dead, but no one else's dad should die in the same circumstances. We also have Cara here from Nebraska. Cara came all the way yesterday, and <laughs> from our table, we consider her lucky because her husband didn't die, but for the last number of years, she has been his sole caregiver, and he has lost quite part of his body and more than we rather to go into. So he is permanently affected for the rest of his life. And, th and she's been on Capitol Hill also and is meeting with her Congress member also. Cara, thank you very much for coming in. I cannot pronounce your last name. That's not going to make a mess of us. Let us also recognize and thank our sponsors. And as we know, putting this together uh, costs a lot of money. And we uh, obviously North Shore LIJ um, Bio Miro, I'm still going to make a mess of the name, but thank you very much. You know who you are. You've done a fantastic job. I was, at, I was at your event last year. Five different speakers all presented it in a different title, so I don't feel too bad about it. Carl Flatley, once again, stepped up to the plate financially along with everything else they've done. Carl, there's not enough times today to say thank you because you could have went away after your daughter died and said nothing. But from the day you came to Capitol Hill until our son died, three million Americans died. And when you shouted for help, no one listened. If they had listened, we all wouldn't be here today. Thank you very much, Carl. <laughs> for anyone who's been on the receiving end of pesky emails for the last number of weeks and brochures and you name it what, the person responsible is Deirdre Hickey below at the door. She has worked 24 hours round the clock. And all she's looking for is a night on the town where she doesn't have to answer her phone at 7 the next morning. Do you get that night tonight, Deirdre? Thank you very much, Deirdre. We've also Scott Sorensen. Scott is here. Scott was a good friend of, Nor of Rory's. He tried to turn him in to be a Green Bay supporter or some foreign team like that, but it didn't work. Scott, thank you. We're also delighted to have many of our friends who have come from Sunnyside because we all know it takes a village. And it takes relations and it takes everyone. But our friends who are here from Queens, New York, some there, some here, some came late. You must have thought it was mass, right? <laughs> and yes, but you're here and thank you very much. Our next speaker, um, don't just go by his bio because he sells himself short, right? Um, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Martin Darfler is one of the best friends we've had. He's on our board. He, answer, he actually answers our calls. There's not many people that'll do that. He replies to our emails. That's more than Kevin Tracy does. Yeah, <laughs> He's Associate Chief Medical Officer and Senior Vice President of Clinical Strategy and Development at North Shore LIJ System. You are a fantastic, I won't say this again, by the way, so you may as well tape it. You are a fantastic man, Dr. Doffler. Thank you very much. So I want to thank you for inviting me today. And first, I want to say I'm hoping my kids are watching when you say things like that about me since uh, they, <laughs> and they don't need to know that. Um, first, let me thank the families uh, for being here, um, for inviting me, 
and for your efforts. Um, folks like Kevin Tracy uh, and others, Conrad, um, have been ringing the bells on this for a long time. Um, and quite honestly, most of us haven't listened. But now that folks like yourselves are coming forward and sharing your loss and the impact that it has, both the loss in, in mortality but in the impact on the survivors, uh, we are listening. Uh, and it is making a difference. So thank you very much for all of that work. Um, second, um, I have the honor of representing 45,000 plus individuals who make up the North Shore LIJ Health System. We've heard several times of the complexity of the work. Um, I will honestly say I don't do it. Uh, it is others. John D'Angelo is here, as uh, uh, Kieran mentioned, who leads our emergency services line. Uh, the thousands of individuals who work in our emergency departments, the tens of thousands that work in the hospitals and elsewhere are the folks who do the work that I will talk a little bit about here today. Um, and so it is my honor to um, represent them. Uh, North Shore LIJ Health System is a special place. Uh, I've worked in a variety of situations and in and out of healthcare over my career. I actually began trying to do research and grow up to be Kevin Tracy and I couldn't do that. Uh, I wasn't as smart as Kevin so I found other things to uh, work on and uh, we're symbiotic in the various approaches that we take. The research side and the practical side of things have to go hand in hand. And I think that's one of the things that is special about our organization that's allowed us to be successful. Um, but what I am here to say is that, um, quite frankly, we already know what to do. And it's not to say that the research isn't really important and we don't need to find more to do. Um, you've heard mention that our health system, uh, and you saw in Dr. Conway's presentation, uh, other places around the country that have been able to reduce sepsis mortality by 50 percent. Um, our number, I think, is somewhere in a 15 percent now. Uh, best in class um, that I'm aware of, Intermountain Healthcare out in Utah, who we have worked with. We've worked with Kaiser, we've worked with others in our formative stages. We're working with others now that we've learned some things to share it, but they're in the single digits, seven, eight percent. So we believe that there's actually room to go to cut our 50 percent in half, another 50 percent. And hopefully over the next five years, we will work to achieve that. Um, let's see whether this works. This is us. Uh, we cover the greater New York metropolitan area. Um, we are a $7 billion organization, as I said, 45,000 plus employees, 9,000 uh, or so physicians within the organization. About a third of those are full-time members of the uh, employed medical staff. Others are voluntary physicians who are part of our community and work very closely with us and their patients come and are cared for by them and us together in our hospitals and clinics. We have a variety of strategic relationships with Cleveland Clinic, Boca Raton Regional Hospital, Montefiore Medical Center in our area through Kevin, the Karolinska Institute, et cetera, all of which help us move forward. We've worked with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, High Vail Healthcare Collaborative, Joint Commission Center for Transforming Healthcare. There are a variety of organizations that all add up to be components of the work that we are uh, continuing to do. Um, surviving sepsis campaign first uh, was announced in the uh, uh, early 2000, it was around 2002, I don't remember the exact timing of surviving sepsis campaign. Um, I was in the industry phase of my life at that point in time and uh, did not see this as something that was going to go anywhere. Uh, sepsis had not really gotten attention and a bunch of critical care people getting together and saying we were going to do something about it. I didn't really see a whole lot of positivity for that. Um, I was wrong. Uh, I hope my kids aren't watching as I, as I say that. Um, but I was wrong. Uh, surviving sepsis campaign has indeed made a difference and the 40 percent awareness we have now is a major improvement on what we had in uh, a decade ago. And a lot goes back to the surviving sepsis campaign. That's not to say that surviving sepsis campaign has been <clears throat> perfect. 
Uh, it began far too ambitious and had 25 or 30 things that we were all supposed to do perfectly. Um, for anybody who is in the improvement science or in an industry of any kind to know that it takes an incredible amount to do one thing perfectly, let alone 30. And so I would argue that some of the impediment to progress being made has been best being the enemy of better. And it's very important that we start with the things that we can do and do them, and then work on the things that are harder to do later, but also prioritize those things which are most likely to have benefit. And the Surviving Sepsis Campaign bundles were updated in 2012, a major improvement. I think there's further improvement to go. But I've highlighted here the 3 hour bundle, and that is my position, is that if we reliably execute the 3 hour bundle from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, which are all things that we know how to do, we also do know that they're hard. Um, the things that are up here, getting antibiotics into individuals who are suspected of having sepsis. This is not once confirmed, as mentioned by Dr. Conway. You don't confirm sepsis. You suspect it and begin treating. And you know that it's sepsis when they get better from your treatment as opposed to otherwise. Um, but the uh, three-hour bundle of timing of antibiotics, um, we've talked at the CDC. And again, Dr. Frieden will be here. Uh, we want to know what we're treating. We don't want to overuse antibiotics, but we also don't want to withhold them uh, in situations where someone's life, limb, uh, organs are at risk. So we need to get blood cultures and other cultures to try to find the organism so that we can narrow our spectrum, define our therapy, broaden it if necessary uh, to new agents. We need to send off some tests. Lactate is the one that's been focused on, but other tests that can be quickly turned around to indicate whether a patient has organ dysfunction. We've not talked about the stages of sepsis, but I'll call simple sepsis, which is probably not a good term to use. Of, not yet having organ dysfunction, but having a systemic inflammatory response to infection. The mortality rate is far lower than once it progresses to what we call severe sepsis when there is presence of organ dysfunction. I don't know if there's organ dysfunction if I don't look for it. So I need to send tests off. Lactate is the one that's been highlighted the most, nonspecific, uh, but very helpful. And you send the rest of it with it. Those first three should be done for everybody. When you get evidence that there is organ dysfunction, it is severe sepsis, and that's generally the situation where life, limb, and injury is at greatest risk. Um, shock is you're really in trouble, and now we're trying to pull somebody back, and we're trying to save a burning building where the roof's already collapsed, et cetera, and so it's another whole stage to it. But the fluids then are important once we recognize that we have organ dysfunction, which can be 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half into our caring for the patient. The first three can be done. Now we can jump on that. And then the, to be completed within six hours, I've made here in small font because, quite honestly, they're important. Conrad touched on the complexities of ICU care, the importance of low tidal volume ventilation and hemoglobin transfusion thresholds and the rest of them. I'm a critical care physician. They'll probably withdraw my card uh, as a membership of SCCM for the last three decades by the statement that I will make, which is that these are not important in achieving the majority of what can be achieved. It is the first three, add the fourth, and an enormous amount can be done. So my call to action here uh, is that we focus on those things which we know unequivocally make a difference. And I will also argue, because we have controversy in the broader medical community between the emergency physician community, the, in, the infectious disease community, the critical care community, as to exactly what the details should be of the six-hour and more advanced bundles. OK. Put it to rest. You do what you do. I'll do what I do. We have no controversy on the first four. Let's just do them. Let's do them reliably every day, every time. Time to antibiotics following septic shock. Uh, this is from 2006. There are several studies, but this was the first that showed that the every hour mattered. This is from a month ago. This is from the surviving sepsis campaign looking at thousands of individuals where the data has been entered over the last decade. This is early in there, and they are almost showing every minute matters. And so the delays that we have, and the delays here are not simply I, as a physician, need to recognize what's going on and write my orders. 
that comes beyond that. How fast do we get an intravenous catheter into somebody to give the antibiotics? How fast could we actually get a temperature on someone to know that they had a fever? Been to the emergency department fully clothed, walking in off the street saying, I've got a bad cough and I've got some green sputum. That's not good enough. We have to do all these various steps. Are the right antibiotics available to me? Can I get them and hang them in a bag and get them flowing into the patient? All of those things have to be done quickly. And this shows us that every minute, certainly every hour counts, so we need to be moving and not simply confirm sepsis, but to suspect it and act upon that suspicion. Conrad uh, mentioned in his, uh, and I think Dr. Conway did as well, it's a little hard to follow everybody's excellent talks here, um, the process trial, uh, which is a very important follow-on to the original work of, of Manny Rivers which was the trigger for surviving sepsis campaign. There's been a lot of criticism of some of that work. Times have changed a lot, although that, that work was published in 2002 or so. It really began in the late 90s, so we're almost 20 years from then. I will argue as well, and I have this on another slide, but I jump around on my talk sometimes, and you'll forgive me, that the control group for the Rivers study in the late 90s and the control group in the process trial got the three-hour bundle. You weren't even entered into the investigation for evaluation as to whether the other things made a difference if you didn't get the three-hour bundle. So we have agreed as a community professionally for over two decades that we should be doing the three-hour bundle, and yet we don't reliably do that. As uh, shown before, the mortality between the three groups was the same. This is a slide, and if he's watching, Dr. Angus, thank you. I stole this from his talk at Greater New York Hospital Association a number of weeks ago. I didn't change it other than to highlight the first piece of here and change the font a little bit. But as you can read, it says that for patients presenting with early septic shock, in the setting of prompt recognition, prompt intravenous fluid bullets for hypotension, and prompt intravenous antibiotics, nothing else mattered. But the rest of what, I thought that nothing else mattered. That's not what he said. I shouldn't quite quote or but paraphrase. But what you chose to do as a professional from there on, regardless of what your judgment was, was the best thing to do for your patient, it didn't make a difference. So very important to know that. He also pointed out in that same talk, we did not test whether early recognition was better than late. They presumed it. I will argue that that has been established for a long time. It's very hard to argue that finding something later, particularly when we have data where prompt administration of antibiotics, once we recognize it, is important. Prompt care was better than delayed care. They didn't test that. And therefore, the study does not undermine efforts to promote things, as I'm suggesting here, the three-hour bundle. Um, this is one figure from a publication from the folks at Intermountain Healthcare um, that was in what we call the Blue Journal, American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. Uh, this is a group that is led by Terry Clemmer. Uh, uh, Miller was the lead author on this. Terry has been very helpful to us, worked with us through IHI, HiVail Healthcare Collaborative, and a couple of other organizations. But in short, this showed, and there's a previous slide to this, that shows that over the years that they were uh, doing this work, they became progressively more reliable in their execution of everything. And what you see here in the upper graph is that as the el eligibility for fluid bullets means that the patients basically met the definition of severe sepsis. That as they got better at giving the early therapy indications, all of the other more advanced therapies were required at a much, much lower level. So patients were less sick, did not require as, as advanced critical care as often, and when they were there, they didn't require as complex interventions as often. So we do know that the three-hour bundle makes a big difference. High compliance, that's also part of what theirs. Us, as I said, we're a special place. We're not unique. We've heard of others, but we're also not the norm. And I think the call to action here by the Staunton Foundation, by the families who are represented, by the families who are not here, and certainly by the rest of the speakers, is that this become the norm. Um, this is some of our data. The specifics of it are probably less relevant than we have it. 
I'm really proud of this data. I'm really proud of data that says that we're not doing well on things. I'm most proud because we know our data. It actually has taken years to do that. But here we have, this is May 2010 to September 2011. Serum lactate within 30 minutes of sepsis, we're under 40%. Antibiotics within 180 minutes, we're at 50%. Blood cultures prior to antibiotics, we're doing okay. Antibiotics within 180 minutes of sepsis, this was combined, somewhere around 60%. When we first started doing this, we didn't even know. And the first data we got was uninterpretable. Now here we are, three years later, blood cultures prior to antibiotics for se severe sepsis and shock in our ED. It's important to recognize in our health system, 80 plus percent of sepsis that we have coded at discharge walked in our doors. There is sepsis as a hospital acquired condition. We do need to eliminate hospital acquired infections, but we need to recognize that the burden of disease is not originating in our hospitals. It is originating in the community. It might, as Aaron Flatley's case shows, start with somebody who came to the hospital, but even in Aaron's case, she went home and came back in and was not recognized at that point in time. So even the hospital-acquired conditions are oftentimes showing up in ambulatory settings, as with Rory Staunton, who went to a private physician office and others uh, in that setting. So we started working in our emergency department and we're now at 80 plus percent with antibiotics within 180 minutes. We actually target to get them in within 60 minutes. I'll show you on another slide average times. Serum lactate turnaround time, we're around 90 percent. Fluid bolus, we're only around 50 percent. We've, we've built our bundle. This is where we've gone to in the fourth stage of it. And here we were when we first started collecting data, we were below 20 percent. So I'm thrilled with the progress. For any of you who represent industry, a 50% defect rate is nothing to sit back and say we're, we're happy with. But I'm really happy that I've moved from an 80% defect rate to a 50% defect rate on my way to achieving what I hope will be highly reliable care in this. Average times. Look at all of this. So we're dropping on our average times in how long it gets to antibiotics and average time to fluid bolus average antibiotic administration time for the various subsets. So we want, to try, we, we want to recognize every single individual. And again, I'll come back to Manny Rivers and process trial. In community settings, every single patient, every single day, does not get the type of care that is routine and required in research. Matter of fact, in the enrollment for these trials, if you don't get that, you're dropped not from continuing to get care, but from the analysis because you didn't meet the requirements. What we need to be doing is getting these measures much closer to 100%. They'll never get to 100%. There are reasons they won't get to 100%. Sometimes you don't get the blood cultures before the antibiotics because you're delaying the antibiotics. Sometimes you don't get the antibiotics because you're for a variety of other reasons, but they should be approaching 100%. And so as excited as I am about this, we have room to go. Um, more of the same, I'm not going to go stick on this one, but I will go to this. Um, and this is data that we are, again, incredibly proud of. Um, it shows a lot of hard work. I'm going to shock you with a piece of information that has nothing to do with what you see on the graph per se and interpreting it, but every one of these dots, which represents a month, represents nearly a thousand individuals. This graph represents nearly 50,000 individuals who have come through our doors and been our responsibility to care for as members of our community over these years. Now this represents sepsis, severe sepsis and shock, but that is an enormous number of individuals to be turned into data points and we need to think of them as individuals, not as data points. But we have moved from the mid-30s to the mid-teens. We've now challenged, and this is with largely focused on the emergency department. We're focusing on inpatient units. We're focusing on transitions of care. We're recognizing we're providing really good care in the emergency department now. Somebody is looking better, and we don't need to send them to the intensive care unit. We send them upstairs to the regular floors. We don't communicate in great detail how bad they looked when they first come in, and now they just get worse and end up in the intensive care unit. So there are gaps everywhere that we need to fix. This is not 
small stuff, even though each little step of it is almost the mundane routine, why do I even pay attention to what size an IV catheter a nurse is going to put in as a routine when someone comes through the door? It all matters as to whether or not you can achieve the timelines you need to achieve. Uh, with that, I say thank you very much and um, Godspeed to everybody in moving forward to achieve the goals that we're setting here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dorfler. We will now take a coffee break and we'll have